Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcome you to an all new Ace of the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing the A6M2N, a Japanese hydroplane stroke fighter coming as a tier 2 and a battle rate in the 2.7. To provide you with a brief historical overview as to this aircraft, from its development through to its operational service, we begin thus. To support its campaigns in the Pacific, the Imperial Japanese Navy, the IJN, acquired a significant number of floatplane and flying boat type aircraft. In 1940, the IJN commissioned the development of a dedicated floatplane fighter, a plane able to operate from water whilst retaining both the firepower and combat capabilities of a contemporary fighter. Such a design would be able to operate from the front line, not having to rely on fixed air fields or aircraft carriers for its deployment. Kawanishi was to lead the development with their M1K Kyofu design. In the meantime, Nakajima was chosen to provide an interim solution based on Mitsubishi's in-service A6M Raisin design. Nakajima's interim solution involved taking the fuselage of an A6M2 Model 11, removing its retractable wheeled undercarriage and replacing it with a triple float undercarriage which was to include a single large float section under the central fuselage and two smaller underwing floats to provide additional stability to the aircraft when it was based on water. Naturally, the fixed nature of the float arrangement was to compromise the aircraft's performance somewhat, and it was eventually found in combat service that the plane sacrificed 20% of its performance relative to the base A6M2 Mod 11, which would make its performance much slower compared to its American adversaries. On the plus side, the original armament of two 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns in the nose and two 20mm Type 99 Mark I cannon in the wings was retained. The prototype was to make its debut test flight on the 7th of December 1941, the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Based on the success of this and subsequent test flights, the aircraft was adopted into service as the A6M2N, the N standing for Nakajima, in 1942. The Allies would give it the code name, Rufi. In combat service, the A6M2N, as depicted on screen today, was primarily used as a defensive role. It saw service at the Aloitians and Solomon Islands, and was effectively used as a means of harassing United States Navy patrol torpedo boats, or PT boats in short. This was done at night by raking them with gunfire and dropping flares to illuminate them for destroyers to target. The aircraft's production lifespan totaled 327 aircraft in all, where as the war went on, its combat effectiveness diminished due to the improved performance of the American fighter types it would face. Still, the plane saw service up to the end of the war in the Pacific as of September 1945, being used as an interceptor to defend the Japanese homeland. And with our historical overview concluded, let's just take a look at how the A6M2N handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the ground strike map, Caucasus, for which we'll be using the following setup. Stealth belts are our machine guns, the reasoning being in my experience the stealth belts are the most powerful out of those on offer, and the lack of tracers attributed to these stealth belt rounds means we can focus on the tracers of our tracer belts for our 20mm cannon. Where these belts contain only high explosive fragmentation tracer rounds, very powerful at close range against enemy fighters, boding well for our turn fighter playstyle, more on that in a second, and therefore when we happen to miss our foes for our high explosive rounds, we've only got 120 in total before we'll need to reload for 60 per cannon, we can quickly redirect our fire accurately onto the target. Our gun convergence is set to 300 meters, again to accommodate the turn fighter playstyle, as we always want to get close to our foes and open fire and rip them out of the sky, not attack them from long distance. And as for our fuel load, we are taking the minimum load of 32 minutes to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscathed on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis then by noting that the climb rate of the A6M2N is rather consistent for its battery rating, if not the most consistent, compared to the planes it can face. And in return, this means that you have the ability over the long term to build up the most altitude out of all the fighters at your battle rating. Now, what I mean by this in terms of what you're seeing here is you've not got the best short term climb rate, and there'll be a good number of planes that are able to outclimb you to say 4,000 meters altitude, such as the MiG 334 and the Hurricanes that you'll see. But in return, once you move out to the side of the map and begin to side climb, you can gradually start to build up your altitude. And to give you a reference point, if you start off at an altitude of 2,500 meters and go into a 25 degree angle climb with a starting speed of 300 kilometers now, and balance things out of a war emergency power effectively, you can get to 5,000 meters altitude, if not more, in a single climb without issue. You won't even be near stall point. Whereas other planes at your battery rating will struggle to do this. 
We've used this as a means of getting some distance from the initial furball that occurred in the centre of the map at a moderate altitude. And in return this has given us the ability to assess what's going on. And we can see that our friendly lag 3 has taken out the POTUS 630, then in return the enemy hurricane has taken out our Apache and now is bringing their way down onto our friendly lag 3. And we can't dive after the hurricane to assist our lag 3 because we do not have the diving characteristics to do so. This plane, in terms of overall speed and diving characteristics, is extremely poor. Let's elaborate. Your maximum dive speed is 805 km an hour, which already starts to fall behind a good number of planes that you'll see at your battery rating. Whether it be the extreme cases at higher battery ratings, such as the P-47s, or alternatively the likes of the lag 3s, the ak ones and as a result of that you will not be able to chase many planes in the dive because on top of that you have to compound the fact that your dive speed acceleration is slow to begin with and only becomes worse particularly when you push beyond 600 kilometers an hour. In terms of straight line acceleration, the story continues, in that you have a rather respectable if not one of the best stall speeds at your battery rating of 80 kilometers an hour, but in acceleration you'll gradually accelerate from 80 kilometers an hour up to 300 kilometers an hour, but you'll need to add in more emergency power to kick this threshold up to 350 kilometers an hour at which point your acceleration drops off dramatically, and in return you'll have difficulty in chasing a good number of foes who can just use straight line speed, even bombers, to get away from you. Now here we're harassing the POTES 633, but we've got an enemy H-75 coming around, the POTES is also taking another look at us, so we're having to manage this 2 versus 1 effectively, and we can see that the H-75 is practically on the verge of a stall, the POTES is breaking away for a limited time, so we can come over the top of the H-75 and cut them apart as they hit their stall point. Meanwhile, as the POTUS comes around, we're going to avoid the incoming fire once again by cutting over the top of them using our maneuverability compared to their rather poor elevator in response in that situation coming up towards us in you know, order to come around and get onto their six and finish them off this time using our 20 mm can to maximum effect. And what you can see is this plane lends itself more towards the slow to medium paced turn fights rather than high speed interception rolls. Now against bombers, and we will see that later, you can attack bombers and intercept them effectively, but it requires you to take a specific approach in my opinion. But returning to the concept of turn fighting then. So this plane is a very strong turn fighter, and you'll see that time and time again here, in the fact that its turn circle is the best of the mono-winged aircraft at its battle rating, having the ability to outturn everything excluding the biplanes that you're going to see, such as the I-153. With that, that means that when an opponent comes towards you, you want to bait them into a turn fight and force them to engage you on your terms. Because you have the ability to come around so quickly on enemy planes, and if you add into your turn circle the very powerful rudder that you have, your turn circle only gets tighter and you can surprise people with your flying capabilities. So let's talk about the free control surface domains, starting off with your roll rate or your ailerons. Your roll rate is your weakest area in the fact that it is below average, and that can be attributed somewhat to the hydroplane configuration in terms of your undercarriage, causing you to have a bit of excess weight in rolling the plane, but in return it does mean that you can dodge the incoming fire, you just need to anticipate the flight path of your opponents, as we saw there against the H-75. When you go to higher speeds, what you'll find is your roll rate locks up between 600 and 700 km an hour, losing 20% of your roll rate performance. Now this is actually a positive in the fact that you can use this plane in a limited boom and zoom function because your roll rate is not too heavily compromised and if you're used to the roll rate at lower speeds you'll get used to it very quickly at higher speeds. Now moving on to the rudder, your most powerful control surface out of those available. What you'll find with your rudder is you can flat turn on a dime and if you add your rudder as mentioned previously into your natural turn circle you'll find this plane comes around quicker than the vast majority excluding biplanes in the midst of the turn fire. And here we can see the CR714 trying to come up towards us, we just cut over the top of them as now as they're trying to loop across, or dive down it would actually seem to be, we're going to harass them with some machine gun fire but we cannot pursue, despite the fact the CR714 is one of the slowest planes at its battle rating as we reviewed previously, review available in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now, and it goes to show how slow the A6M2N is in direct comparison. In terms of high speed lockup, what you'll find with your rudder is that between 600 and 700 km an hour, you'll lose 50% of your rudder's controllability, meaning that precise aim beyond 700 km an hour in a boom and zoom dive can be a little bit more difficult compared to other aircraft available. But the last aspect, the elevator, is again rather strong. 
Now, whilst its overall performance is average, it's a very consistent control surface and means you can loop very easily in this plane. And your looping circle is one of the best at the battle rating, being able to outloop the vast majority of your foes. And this gives you an advantage in the fact you can outturn and outloop your counterparts for the purposes of a turn fight. And it means that typically you're not going to have a situation where you are going to struggle to win the turn fight unless it's an enemy biplane. And for reference, in regards to your elevator, you'll find between 600 and 650 kilometers now, you will lose 25% of its performance, but this isn't too much of an issue, seeing as you're not going to particularly be focusing on boom and zoom dives, and even in losing 25%, you can still use your elevator reasonably well in those high speed dives. And another thing to note, perhaps not typically seen on planes at the battle rating, is that your negative G response on your elevator is just as strong as your positive G response, in that you can inverted loop this plane just as easily as your standard loop. Now coming away from control surfaces, we see the H-75 off in the distance, we're actually building altitude, we're going to try and force a turn fight with them, we encourage them to turn fight with us. You'll have noticed so far that our playstyle has focused so heavily around turn fighting that you could say our playstyle has been defensive. We've been waiting for the engagements to come to us, not the other way. And that's one of the difficulties in flying the A6M2N. You'll be used to the fact that the preceding planes, such as the Kai 27 the Kai 43 and the A5M4, typically they're just as defensive as they are offensive. You can go tank the turn fight to your foes and vice versa. You can let your foes come to you and you can react and out turn fight them. But in this plane, because of the noticeable difference in speed, even when you are the top battery rating aircraft or are the top battery rating aircraft in the match, as we have seen in this match in particular, I think this is a perfect example of it and it only gets worse as you go into higher battery rating matches all the way up to 3.7. What you find is that you wait for your foes to come to you and start the fight. And that's why we're now dealing with the Marine Sound the F410 who's come charging towards us to go for the head-on. We cannot afford to go into the head-to-head -head with them, more on that in a second. But as they now start to break away and head away, we can get onto their six and trap them in the turn fire. And the idea is you don't want to let up against your foes. As soon as you get them close enough, you want to bring them down before they consider diving away or pulling distance in a straight line. Because then you are at the whim of your foe choosing when the next engagement occurs. And that's why the areas which can cause you difficulty if you find the likes of say a Heinkel 100 D1, a significantly lower battery rate in aircraft, who decides just to peck at you via boom and zoom attacks, in that you do not have the ability to control when they'll be able to enact those boom and zoom attacks, your opponent is going to have the initiative until you pull them close and get them into that turn fight. Now your still speed being 80 km now, you can of course surprise your foes by simply climbing up towards them when they're trying to loft over the top of you and they think that you've already stalled out. And the fact you won't have stalled out, you'll be one of the last to do so, and you can use that as a countermeasure. And then coming back to the concept of bomber interception, what you're now going to see is that we attack this plane called 111, from a distance and we come up them roughly in the head-to-head -head state, although off to a slight angle, and what it means is we can knock out the entire plane, without the possibility of significant return fire until the last possible moment. And we need to manage engagements like this in terms of the interceptor role, because the durability of this aircraft is atrocious, and that even hits with a light calibre machine gun can shred this plane. And you'll find the rearward machine guns of a Junkers 87, for example, will cause you significant damage and have the ability to pilot snipe you if you get too close. And even with a maximum vitality crew setting, in terms of your skills, you'll find that pilot snipes in this plane are rather frequent if you expose your cockpit, and in return it can build up a bit of frustration. Add to that, impacts to the planes over your fuselage have the ability to knock off large chunks of your hydroplane setup in terms of the undercarriage. If you lose one of these smaller floats under the wings, this plane will list very heavily to one side. You can find that your control surfaces get knocked off easily. Or on top of that, the plane is just set on fire and burns to death rapidly. And getting hit in this plane is not a comfortable experience. And in return, that's why we've been avoiding head-on engagements. And it's why when we're going for enemy bombers, we try to come at angles where they can only get one turret pointed towards us, if not any at all. We can see here against the F222.2, we've only got one machine gun engaged in us initially, another one opened fire briefly by the looks of things, but it was enough to bring them out of the sky before they could start to hit us accurately. Now of course having the 300 meter gun convergence does have the downside to the fact that at longer distances and engaging enemy bombers, you'll find that your convergence does hold you back a little bit. But there it worked out for us on the F222, and that's typically because we're engaging bombers with less protection and less defensive protection, so less armor, less gun power and we're going to do the same against the B-18. Imagine I'll reload accordingly. So what else is there to note here? Well, if we switch back to ideal speed ranges and ideal altitude, you'll find that your ideal speed range of 275 to 375 is where this plane will feel its most comfortable, in that a number of aircraft your face will feel comfortable in this speed range, but more so you simply because all your control surfaces will be responding at their maximum potential, and this plane, despite its rather heavy looking nature, due to the hydroplane undercarriage, feels very light at the controls. 
Meanwhile, in terms of your ideal altitude range, you can use this plane at most altitudes, where it be from ground level all the way up to 4,000 meters without issue. It's only once you head towards 4,750 meters, you'll find that your engine performance begins to drop off, and particularly above 5,000 meters altitude, it drops off dramatically. Whereas in terms of your control surfaces, above 5,000 meters altitude, your elevator becomes rather heavy and your roll rate starts to drop off as well, something you need to manage. And here's the concept of durability. I don't want to get hit by the A20G's 12.7 meters of brand new machine gun turrets, so instead I duck out of the way and almost duck into a head on my POTA 631, but dodge out of the way and just head off towards friendly territory. And energy retention, as you may suspect, is very poor in the vertical. This is not a boom and zoom style aircraft. In a straight line, your speed will drop off and only start to hold around the 400 and 25 km an hour mark, and in the horizontal, the energy retention is a little bit better, but keep in mind you will bleed considerable speed if forced into multiple hard turns in this plane, and you may need to level out at some point to rebuild your speed. With that, the game comes to its end, and it's time for us to take a look, as always, at the post-game stats. With our 10 kills, we are able to pick up 22,759 silver lines and 3,008 research points. To defeat the A6M2N in a given matchup, I can recommend one or two approaches. Number one is to engage the plane in a series of boom and zoom strikes, particularly in the opening stages of the game, where your aircraft will have the stronger short-term climb rate, being able to get to higher altitudes sooner than this aircraft, which relies more on its long-term climb rate. In attacking this plane through boom and zoom, you'll only need one successful pass typically in order to bring it out of the sky. But do keep in mind if you miss and go into your return climb, the A6M2M pilot may try to follow you using their strong low stall speed of 80 km an hour and their rather powerful stall recovery of only needing to get to 140 km an hour and that's a rather rapid recovery in order to follow you back up to higher altitude and cause you issues as you begin to stall out yourself. Option number two is to engage this plane in a head to head and planes with centerline mounted cannon, such as the Yak-1, the Lag-3, or alternatively, a large number of machine guns are set to longer distance conversions, such as the 12.7mm machine guns on the A-36, will all work well in this regard. In being able to cut this plane down due to its poor durability in the head-to-head -head before the A6M2M pilot is able to return fire, typically using a tighter convergence on their 20mm cannon due to their turn fighter nature. But by avoiding such circumstances in our own aircraft today, Hopefully we've demonstrated the A6M2N is a very powerful turn fighter for its battle rating. Where it's not a plane that can dictate the engagement, it can try to encourage foes to engage it into a turn fight, but it lacks the speed in order to be confrontational, and instead has to rely on waiting for its opponents to make the mistake of coming too close to it, and then getting stuck in a turn fight with this plane, and then having to rely on using their speed in order to dive away from it. But by the time they realise that, the A6M2N will have already brought its 20mm cannon around to bear, and ripped the foe out of the skies. Therefore, this plane I would attribute as being one that's made for the defensive stance, in that it has to play in a defensive role for the vast majority of the game. The only aggressive role it can really go for is the occasional boom and zoom strike on an unsuspecting foe, or alternatively, in intercepting a less well-armed and armoured enemy bomber. But otherwise, this is a plane that rewards those who avoid getting hit, but in return, can hit for maximum effect. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.